welcome to a very special on location bookmark interview with one and only Father Robert Spitzer, of course, of EWTN fame from uh, the great Father Spitzer's Universe program and multitudinous books. We've got 13 books and num numerous scholarly articles, and this is coming to you from our family celebration in Phoenix when we actually tape this particular program. It's always tough to get Father corralled in person. This is <laughs> one of the few times we got to not be uh, watching each other uh, on telescreens, talking back and forth. It's great to be with you, Father. It's great to be with you too, Doug. And Wow, real time and yeah, exactly. real proximity. That's right. You don't even need to wear an earpiece to hear each other talk. Right? That's right. <laughs> so this is the moral wisdom of the Catholic Church in defense of her controversial moral teachings. Why are they controversial and why did you decide to write a book about them? Well, I began to look at the data that was coming out from the Pew survey and other surveys that showed that Catholics in general did not uh, believe many of the church's moral teachings and especially young people who seemed to reject them and a tremendous misunderstanding uh, of the teachings, uh, especially by young people who actually thought that the church may be insensitive or cruel to maybe someone who is uh, uh, in a homosexual lifestyle or mm -hmm. a transgender person. And so I just thought, boy, if they really understood uh, what was going on in, in the church's teaching, how it related, first of all, mm -hmm. to Christ's view of love, but also how the church's teachings, which are the interpretation of Christ's teachings, how those really impacted emotional health, spiritual health, and relational and marital health, and to see that, boy, if you adhere to the church's teachings, then you're going, your emotional health is going to be much better as well as your spiritual health and relational health. And uh, if you do not adhere mm -hmm. to the church's teachings, you can depend on this. Your depression, anxiety, uh, and, and suicidal levels will increase doubly or right. sometimes even triply. And um, in addition to that, your practice of your spiritual life will plummet considerably, almost down to right. zero, and a myriad of other kinds of things. So I thought people need to hear this information so that the elephant in the room uh, is uh, finally made right. you manifest. Right, and you have the statistics here from the various studies over the years. In the beginning, you say the purpose and perspective and the method of this book. We talk about the purpose. What about the perspective and the method? Why are those two important? Well, because, uh, first of all, they decided to use uh, secular surveys to justify all my opinions. Uh, because I didn't want anybody saying, well, that's just Catholic Church propaganda. Mm -hmm. So I went into the archives of general psychiatry, or I went to Pew Survey if it dealt with a more general population matter, or studies from a variety of secular universities, uh, just to make sure that people uh, you know, would not subject me to the accusation mm -hmm. of religious bias in the studies that I used. Right. But with purely secular studies, you can show that the uh, church's teaching is not only good for your spiritual health, it's definitely good for your uh, uh, emotional health, your relational health, your marital health. And in addition to that, you can count on this, right. that if you follow the church's teachings, your depression level, anxiety level, uh, substance abuse level, familial tension level, right. and suicide so why level does it will take go down. a Catholic priest in his book to bring out the secular information that we never hear about in the secular society. You just said it because the secular media is not going to reveal it. Mm -hmm. It's the elephant in the room. I mean, people will come out and they'll talk about what a good thing it is to support someone in a transgender lifestyle, but then they don't say that 10 years after uh, you uh, get the sex change, your suicide rate will go up 2,000%, right. 20 times. So, I mean, uh, uh, it's again, all the hidden stuff that is not uh, uh, you know the whole truth mm -hmm. that's not given by the secular media somebody had to do it so I decided I'm gonna do it um, and I'm gonna do it within the context too of the church's teaching and do it within the context of Jesus's right. view of love what he intended us for uh, at the creation of the world now you say if we had a glimmer of the truly overwhelming love of the Lord for us the great peril intended for us by our spiritual enemy bracket Satan, we'd not hesitate to seek, accept, and follow the whole moral truth given by Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. So the question is, why aren't people catching that glimmer? And in the world we live in today, 
Uh, you're talking about the idea of peril intended for, what peril? Isn't everybody yeah. going to heaven? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, as you can see, a lot of people are being led into darkness. And mm -hmm. the first manifestation is that they're abandoning um, their uh, religious uh, practice, and then they're abandoning their religious faith, right? The, uh, the rise of atheism. Mm -hmm. And along with this, we see this huge increase in suicidality. We see a huge increase in homicides. We just see cultural uh, rifts of every kind under the sun. But the, the most remarkable thing is the, the, the sense of emptiness, alienation, mm -hmm. loneliness, malaise, depression, anxiety. I mean, it's just hugely increasing in our society as we put our faith in ego comparative identity, as we, uh, we uh, poo poo religion as if it were something uh, that belonged to a bygone age. Yeah, yeah. enslaving pious pretension unfair in the work of domineering church trying to control our lives, right? That's right. People are saying, yeah, you've got this domineering church, but what the church is saying is mm -hmm. precisely what's good for you, what's good for your emotional health, what's going to lead you into the light, which is going to keep you out of the clutches of Satan, who has so many different programs for each and every one of us right. uh, to lead us to get us to choose hell. And uh, a lot of us, I do believe, are choosing hell mm -hmm. simply because it is not only so seductive, but because they've been practicing uh, you know, themselves in the darkness for so long that they, they find it exceedingly difficult right. to turn around. Even when Christ allowed conversion at the last moment, they won't do it, they can't do it, they don't know how to do it, mm -hmm. they feel so alienated they can't do it. And so, uh, yeah, I think that we're in a, a, an age of uh, terrible spiritual right. crisis manifest with the emotional crisis that's very clear in all the statistics and also manifest uh, in the marital and uh, relational crisis. Right. Now, you right. quote Dostoevsky here, and uh, you've been mm -hmm. uh, quoting him quite often on, the, on our show recently, sure. Anna Karenina. Yeah. Uh, but this one, you talk about the one from the brothers Karen Masov, the concept of enslave us to a miracle. Yeah, so the, the point, of course, is that uh, uh, Jesus is not going to force us mm -hmm. uh, to obey the moral teachings that he has uh, given us directly or that uh, the church has interpreted his teachings to mean. Mm -hmm. And so uh, rather than do that, he gives us subtle hints. Uh, he tries to stay within the bounds of our ability to choose. So he's not going to come down and go, Spitzer, and give me a miracle, and, I, and I'm going to get really scared, and I'm going to go, oh my gosh, I better obey the, the church's moral teaching. Uh, instead, though, he will give plenty of evidence for himself. Right. He'll give it in science, or he'll give it in uh, maybe you know the near-death experience uh, studies that we've talked about previously. He gives it in all kinds of ways. But he's not going to force us to choose. He's not going to you know blast us or threaten us. Or uh, if we're about to disobey a command, he's not going to uh, threaten us with a lobotomy. So um, at the uh, at the end of the day, uh, he's going to allow us to be right. free, and that even even means we're free to choose hell. We're free to choose of following the evil spirit right into the domain of darkness, right. thinking all the while that we are wise, when in fact we are fools beyond Yeah, belief. you say here, why would we choose our enemy's way? Quite simply, we might think that the enemy's way is the path to true happiness. That's right. And, and that's so, what the culture uh, seems to be pushing. Oh, right? yes. Uh, black has become white and white has become black. And so now the culture's uh, view of happiness, right? You're going to be happiest when you are uh, filled with pride, ego comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. When your Instagram profile is just better than everybody else's Instagram profile. And when you're looking like you're at the top of your game and you're admired by all the end people, then you're really going to truly be happy. Happy. Boy, if you have a lot of braggable, uh, you know, uh, accoutrements about your life, great house, great swimming pool, great yeah. car, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to really be happy. But you won't be happy. That's the whole point. And that's We're where made the despair comes more. in, right? That's, that's where, where the despair, despair comes up. in. And that's where the malaise right. comes in. Right. And that's eventually, you know, you look at all these people, you go, how can so many people who have it so good be so depressed, so anxious, right. so suicidal? How can this be? Because 
<laughs> we're made for God, that for thou hast made us for thyself. Right. And our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Now you say, you talk about the Catholic teaching and you, and you go to reaction a lot of people have. So I'm certainly, this is from your own personal experience, mm -hmm. that teaching's unfair, this group is unfairly mm -hmm. burdened and marginalized. Yeah. In our seemingly justifiable compassion and outrage and injustice, we're tempted to go against the teaching of Christ and his church. What's worse, to abandon the church herself and, and the, the fact that these consequences are so pro profoundly negative and seemingly so justifiable, we stand on the brink of the abyss. Given these consequences, we must ask ourselves the following question before we make a judgment. Why would Jesus or his church teach this? Yeah, and that is the question. We, I mean, obviously they're not teaching this to become unpopular. Right. So there's got to be another reason they're teaching it because they think it's commensurate with Jesus Christ's teaching. There must be an, yet another reason for that too, that uh, that teaching has something to do with our getting into heaven. That teaching has something to do with our ability to live a life that is filled with joy mm -hmm. instead of emptiness, loneliness, alienation, dread, malaise, and, and suicidality, right? So that, that at some point we know that that uh, these teachings, every single one of the church's teachings, every one of them that is found controversial by the culture is incredibly important, not only for our spiritual health, but our relational health, marital health, and emotional health above all. And more than that, you know, people say, oh, you know, uh, you, you're teaching something that's so unfair to right. that group. Right. Well, wait a minute. It may be unfair in the sense that that lifestyle is, is being criticized, but there's a reason the lifestyle is being criticized. Because the lifestyle is fundamentally unhealthy. The lifestyle is winding up increasing the suicide rates by anything from five times to 20 times, depending upon the lifestyle we're, we're talking about. Right. Every single one of the church's teachings, if you systematically disobey that, you can expect a suicide Side increase in the neighborhood of anywhere between four times to 20 times, right. depending on the lifestyle. And you look at that and you go, well, there it is. I mean, that's the truth, the whole truth that's not being told. It deserves to be told. So then I'm going to put it all in one volume. Right. I'm going to do the, the homosexual lifestyle. I'm going to do transgenderism. I'm going to do pornography. I'm going to do abortion. I'm going to do post-abortion syndrome. I'm going to do physician-assisted suicide. I'm going to do the whole thing from start to finish, birth control, artificial birth control and every single issue that everybody says is a bunch of anachronistic ho uh, you know right. hokum you know I, I'm you have it as listed as like the 12 moral teachings that you kind of focus yeah, on. yeah exactly, exactly I thought it was interesting you said you talk about these being systematically violent we hear this term everything syst systematic <laughs> systematic yeah. everything what do you mean systematically violated? Well, that means to say that, you know, you, you take a comprehensive approach to violating it in your life, helping other people to violate it in their lives, listening to the culture uh, in its, in its uh, violation, and then you uh, reinforce the culture in turn. So everything is like a great, a system is an integrated, uh, you know, like a machine, mm -hmm. uh, an integrated uh, a series of composite parts. And those integrated uh, uh, composite parts, you're contributing uh, to that. You're contributing to the culture that's contributing back to you. You're contributing to the people around you. You're, you're contributing to the whole machine. Right. It's not just you and your private life, but it's you who are interacting with the world. You who are supporting that homosexual lifestyle, for example, that could be exceedingly bad, uh, not just for yourself in terms of your own emotional life, uh, but it could be exceedingly bad for other people that you're in encouraging in the lifestyle and then of course you could contribute to the culture to get them to go ahead mm. and and reinforce this lifestyle so that's the whole point about the systematic right. it's just that okay. it's you're you're part of the integration of the I part you. so you talk about the purpose of the book first and foremost to help educators particularly in high school and college catechists as well particularly in confirmation programs parents and other churches to give a rational defense of the major controversial moral teachings and I guess this would also be good for parents maybe of the kids who are in those brackets as well to get a better understanding so when they're talking to their kids about it right yeah absolutely and so uh, hopefully the parents can actually uh, sit down and say you know there might be a reason for this now i'm working with the uh, sophia institute for teachers 
uh, right now on a, a curriculum for senior year high school elective mm -hmm. on moral apologetics. And I don't think there is a moral apologetics course available except this one that uh, Sophia is producing with me uh, right now. Right. Uh, but the reason I'm doing it is because I, I, I not only think the students need to hear uh, this whole rationale, the parents need right. to hear the rationale. I mean, if, you, if you're, you know, somebody's telling you that cohabitation is a good thing, it's a terrible thing. Right. It's a terrible and thing you have the for your statistics to prove it. Absolutely, right, and that's and that's that's the whole thing. Is I, I can't believe that people are saying cohabitation's good, or the longer you cohabitate, the better you are. The exact opposite is the truth, as proven in these statistical studies. And so, the longer you cohabitate, the, the much more likely your marriage is to wind up in divorce, the much more likely you are going to be dissatisfied in your marriage, the much more likely there's going to be incongruity between the male partner and the female partner on the expectations right. for the marriage and the, public, the publicity of the marriage going forward into the future, the much more you're going to be divorced right. from your religious, you know, I mean, literally, the longer you cohabitate, the more you separate yourself from your religion, not just from the right. other partner. It's not just going to increase fighting within the, in, right. within the partnership, it's going to do all that stuff, you look at it and you go, are you kidding me? Who said cohabitation was a good idea? Not even the secular media believes it. It's that. interesting, too, how, yeah. how that yeah. hits right on commitment. Yeah. And one of the other things you're pointing out is this sense of lack of commitment, and especially even in people's spiritual lives, yeah. which then leads to greater lack of commitment, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is a, what's called a reciprocal correlation uh, between religion and marriage. Marriage, a good marriage helps the religious practice, not only of the kids, but of both spouses. And a, a good religion, uh, right, um, really helps the marriage and strengthens the marriage and even helps it toward the kids. So uh, it, it actually has a reciprocal causative effect. Um, and it keeps building on each other. The couple that prays together stays together. Nothing right. truer could be said. And so uh, you can actually show this. The Thornton studies are actually really excellent studies that show this correlation. And now there's several other uh, studies that have been done by seven different universities that uh, show the same correlation right. between uh, religious practice and good, strong marriages and also good, strong marriages and religious practice. Right. Now, you talk about this being, as so many do, the age of moral relativism and, mm -hmm. and the idea of abandoning objective moral norms in favor of consequentialism, situationalism, and emotivism. Motivism. Yeah. Uh, and some of those are not just out in the secular culture. Some of those you find in the church. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, right? uh, there's no question that the, the secular culture is, you know, the backwash is coming right into the church. And uh, even some moral authorities uh, have put their trust in, in these things. But the minute you abandon an objective moral principle, mm -hmm. the minute you abandon, uh, you know, principles upon which we can form our conscience, the moment you abandon uh, uh, those principles, you're abandoning conscience as well. And not only that, but you're abandoning the objectivity of moral decision making. You're making ethics into a pure subjectivism. And, and once you do that, of course, uh, anything goes. And, um, and uh, have, has that been said in the church? Yes, it has right. been, unfortunately. But that is becoming corrected uh, more and more, I think, a little bit more. I, I'm seeing some right. turn of events since uh, Pope That's Benedict good. Uh, pointed out the terrible consequences of moral relativism creeping into the church. What, what about the concept of social norming? Why did you talk? About oh that? yeah, social norming is a huge problem, right? Social norming basically means that we norm ourselves according to what we think the culture um, uh, is doing. So, for example, if I think that the mainstream of the culture has uh, four uh, scotches for every meal, mm. right? You know, I'll, um, and I'm, let's suppose I'm only having a beer at every meal. I will naturally norm up, if I didn't have the Catholic moral teaching right. or some other objective moral teaching, what I would normally do is look at that statistic and go, wow, 
I'm below the norm. I guess I should have another couple of scotches for every meal. And so you can actually right. norm yourself to a worse moral position because you think that's where the mainstream is. Well, you is. could drink two and feel really good about yourself yeah. considering most are having four. Right? Yeah, that's exactly correct. Right. And the trouble is, of course, it reinforces itself. So then the norm goes up, the average goes up, and you go, wow, now the norm is, uh, is up there at about 4.5, and I'm just down to two. I may as well move to three, and I can feel really good about myself. And you get the reverse of that with the def basically defining deviancy down. Yeah, exactly. We'll continue to lower the standards to That's right. meet our behavior. That's correct. Absolutely correct. Now, you also talk in here about, you say, religion is declining, conscience has been explained away or numbed, and authoritative social norms have been replaced by the doctrine of autonomy as fulfillment and identity politics. Yeah. I mean, that's basically it. We don't have anything else to fall back on, right? So, you know, we've abandoned objective morality. We've abandoned religious morality. We've abandoned our conscience. So I got to go to politics or something to get uh, whatever sense of, of, of order. I have no interior moral compass. So I have to have my, uh, you know, my identity politic group tell me what to do. Mm. They're going to be kind of the, the way that, the, you know, the, the, the moral arrow points where they tell me. Now, you can just see a totalitarian kind of thing happening here because you give over your moral will to, you know, a, a political group, right? The identity of a political group that you identify with. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you do that, uh, you know, uh, basically your moral will is no longer your own. You've enslaved yourself mm -hmm. to the will of another. And I'm not going to call it the moral will of another, mm -hmm. to the arbitrary power invoked will of an identity politic group. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you do that, what a fool you would be. Yet look at the lemmings in our culture that are basically leaping after their identity politic group to tell them what to do as indentured servants to the identity politic group. And at the same time, they have given up their own moral authority, their own conscience, their own religion, their own ability to choose. They've given them given themselves over to a secular and debased non-moral political group to make the determination right. for them. It's an appalling state of affairs. Right. Now, you go on to talk about uh, different areas here, uh, strengthening the foundation of Catholic moral teaching. You have, uh, you have in number two and number three in this section, you say evidence for the Christian perspective, then you go specific, evidence for the Catholic perspective. Is there a difference between those perspectives? Well, there, there is, uh, uh, you know, some differential um, there because the Catholic Church speaks to sexual issues uh, and to the abortion issue, the life issues, I think much more strongly than some uh, Christian uh, denominations. There are other Christian denominations that speak just as strongly about pro-life issues and, and uh, sexual issues as the Catholic Church. But for a long time, our culture has been preparing the way to say that sexual issues are really victimless sins. Mm -hmm. But they're not victimless sins. More murders are committed about sexual things than just about anything else. They're not victimless sins. We know that the, the you know, Pornography, for example, is not a victimless sin because the, the longer you watch pornography, the more your religious level of practice is going to go down. It's directly or inversely correlated. So the, you watch pornography more, your religious practice goes down concomitantly, almost a perfect inverse correlation. And it's not just that, but your depression level goes up. You say, how could your depression level go up? Your depression level goes up even though you are getting temporary elation from watching the pornography, uh, you know, on your screen or whatever, you, that temporary elation wears off, as St. Right. Ignatius would say, and what follows in its wake? Depression. And you go up in those um, depression scales more and more and more along with the, the, um, right. the, the riskier sexual behaviors you're taking. Right, you need a greater thrill, a greater high, whatever. That's I, right. I saw that working on the Playboy channel so yeah. in my youth. Yeah. So, and uh, also, I, I, you know, you lose your whole sense of emotional intimacy. Right. That's why you have double the divorce rate as you become habituated to pornography. Once you become addicted to pornography, 
it's tripled the divorce rate. And of course, the job loss stuff is unbelievable because people find you out at work right. that what you're doing is looking at the pornography instead of right. working, et cetera, et cetera. We've, uh, yeah. we've just uh, scratched the surface just before we go. Yeah. Uh, would you prefer writing quartets or trilogies? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, trilogies are easier. One less <laughs> book. So uh, I'll probably stick with that. Stick in with the that future. one. Okay. <laughs> and this year, Father Spitzer's latest book out uh, this uh, November, uh, The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, a Defense of Her Controversial Moral Teachings. It's volume three of the trilogy, okay, so that's why I mentioned it. <laughs> Called Out of Darkness, Contending with Evil Through the Church, Virtue and Prayer. So thank you so much, Father Spitzer. It's always wonderful to talk to you specifically about your books. And of course, I'll see you on the show. I'll see you on the show. Absolutely. The one and only Father Spitzer. Uh, part of Father Spitzer's Universe, special EWTN bookmark coming to you from our Phoenix family celebration. We're having a wonderful time. Wish you were here. We'll see you next time on Bookmark. <laughs>